So we decided that if we were going to do a good job of studying this virus, we need to develop some good tools. And I think this is true four years later today, even more so than it was when we first started. So um, we developed uh, an antibody by injecting rabbits with um, XMRV, that, you know, inactivated XMRV, so they wouldn't get sick. So it was uh, completely inactivated, injected it into the rabbits, and then collected their sera and showed that the sera reacts with XMRV proteins. So these are various XMRV proteins that have been run on a gel, and here you can see the bands that light up with this specific anti-serum. Now, um, XMRV is about 90% at least identical to Maloney murine leukemia virus. So these are, um, this is the virus that we've been studying in the lab all, all along, and you can see that this anti-serum picks up other uh, proteins from MLV as well, okay? And this will become relevant because we will talk about, uh, uh, Suzanne has already talked about this, of the finding of other MLVs in chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, a more specific antiserum is the antiserum that re reacts with the envelope protein. So remember we said that the envelopes are kind of different and they give the specificity of, uh, dif to different receptors and this um, antiserum made against just the envelope protein uh, recognizes only the XMRV envelope and not the Maloney envelope. So there, there's a bunch of reagents that we can use for different things. The other thing we, um, oh, so before we go on, so here's the antiserum at work in the cells that are infected with XMRV on a dish. And you can see that wherever there's brown staining is XMRV proteins are being expressed. These cells here, only one in a hundred cells are infected, and you can see that it picks up that infected cell and does not pick up the non-infected cells, showing that it's nice and sensitive and quite specific. And these two are other controls. One is the pre-immune serum, showing that the rabbit did not have any pre-existing antibodies to XMRV. And the other one is um, anti-serum against non-infected cells and again showing specificity. Now if you apply this to tumors, and I'll show you a bigger version in a second, you can pick up uh, prostate cancer cells with it. And so this is what, under the high magnification, a prostate cancer cell looks like this with this granular cytoplasmic staining, and here you see tissue culture cells have the same pattern of granular cytoplasmic staining when they're infected with XMRV. So this antiserum looks like it's quite specific for what we want to, what we want to look at. The other tool that we developed is quantitative real-time PCR. So um, this is a, a, a PCR that's you know, very sensitive, uses a TACMAN-based um, fluorescent probe. Uh, the nice thing about it is that once you set up the reaction and you carry out the reaction in the machine, the machine just reads it through the tube, the fluorescence, and you never have to open the tube. This becomes important when you are doing patient data, so you're not contaminating um, one patient's sample with another patient's sample. And I must tell you that not everyone does this. A lot of people in this uh, XMRV world are using nested PCRs. Now nested PCRs mean you have a set of primers that are called the outer primers. You do a PCR reaction, then you open the tube, you take out a tiny amount of that reaction, you put it in another tube, and now you use nested primers, meaning another set of primers inside, which gives it a lot more sensitivity and specificity. But, but in the act of opening the tube and transferring stuff, you can contaminate from one specimen to the other. And PCR being a very sensitive technique, you just need a tiny drop that you can't even see in order to contaminate this. So, um, so our MyLab has stayed away from any nested PCR approaches, and, um, and we have stuck to these. The point of the slide was to sh tell you that this is an extremely specific PCR. So it only picks up XMRV. It doesn't pick up the MLVs that um, uh, might be implicated, uh, but it also prevents you from picking up mouse viruses, which are a source of contamination. I will come to it in a second. So, um, so you just have to know what tools you have when you use them. So here's our study. 
we looked at, this was uh, done when we were still at Columbia University in New York, we looked at 233 consecutive cases of radical prostatectomy um, that came to the hospital at Columbia. And we looked at 101 controls. Um, and in, in for, to get controlled prostate tissue, you can't really ask a normal person <laughs> because they're not going to you know, say, yes, go ahead, take my prostate out. Uh, so these are all people who had a benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, which is a condition that elderly men often develop. And um, they're treated with a transurethral resection. Um, and so this was the transurethral resection sample. And we analyzed these samples by our uh, quantitative PCR and by our immunohistochemistry using the antisera. And um, this is what the antisera shows you in the tumor. So remember I show, told you that the original paper showed that the uh, virus was present in rare stromal cells, not in the malignant cells themselves. And here we see, we used a specific antisera that we generated. You can see the virus in, in the malignant cells. So here's an acinus of the prostate. And each, each of these is a cell. And inside each cell you can see this purple nucleus. So that kind of gives you um, uh, a, a way to look for the cells. In the, and each of these cells is just chock full of XMRV proteins. So everything that's brown is representing XMRV proteins. Here's this little inset that's been enlarged. You can see that same kind of granular pattern that I showed you before. So here is the virus present in malignant cells. It's a lot of variation, though, from patient to patient. This is one of our cases that expresses a lot of XMRV proteins. And here I'm showing you two other cases that are on the other spectrum that express very little XMRV protein. So um, this is one case. And you can see here, this is enlarged here. The, there's the same kind of cytoplasmic granular pattern, but not all cells have it. There are some cells that are completely clean, and then there are others that are expressing virus. And you can see the same thing here in this case as well, that again, you have this granular pattern of staining, but then there are many cells that are cancerous, but not expressing any XMRV proteins. So uh, that's all consistent with, uh, you know, all, each one of these was counted as an XMRV positive prostate cancer. This is a summary of what we found. Um, we found that 27% of prostate cancers tested positive for XMRV using either the PCR or the immunohistochemistry. So, you know, we added everything. And then this is our controls. Our controls showed that 6% of people either had PCR positive or IHC positive for XMRV. And what does that mean? So either it means that our tests have a, a rate of false positive, that is 6%. That's, you know, that's quite um, you know, acceptable for first generation testing for anything. Uh, the other possibility is that these are people with benign prostatic hyperplasia today, and maybe 10 or 20 years later, they, they are the same people who will get prostate cancer. And there's really no way for us to know this. These are all the identified specimens. We cannot go back to look at them again. Um, and the third possibility is that uh, when you do a transurethral resection, you're taking out the tissue from around the urethra. That's not where prostate cancer develops. Prostate cancer usually develops in the periphery of the gland. So these might be people who already have prostate cancer, and we wouldn't know it at the time that this, these samples were taken. So there are many explanations for this 6%. Uh, but the important take home is that 27% of the cancers tested positive for XMRV. So, so for the first time we showed that there was a difference between the test population with prostate cancer and the controls. We also showed that the more aggressive the tumor, and Gleason grade is a way of um, uh, assessing aggressiveness, the more aggressive the tumor, the more likely it was to have XMRV. The other thing we saw was that we didn't see any association between either the stage of the tumor or the age of diagnosis. And finally, what um, the previous paper had shown, that there was a strong association between RNAs, L genotype, and XMRV, we didn't see any association at all. And now there are many, many other uh, there's studies that have come out showing that this association is not seen, and the original people also now say that, that that's probably true. So here is the cancer people and control people with the three different genotypes 
and there's really no difference between uh, cancer with XMRV, cancer without XMRV, controls with XMRV, controls without XMRV. They all have the same frequency of alleles. What is the implication of that? The implication is that the whole population, and not just the 10% that's homozygous for this allele, is susceptible to XMRV infection. So our original assumption that you know, it'll be a small fraction of the 10% of people who have this allele is, is probably not true, that we, we are probably all, irrespective of our RNA cell genotype, are susceptible to XMRV in, 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 uh, in the same way, or you know, we don't yet know what makes us more susceptible. So to summarize, 27% of prostate cancers have XMRV. More aggressive tumors have a higher chance of containing XMRV. Viruses found in the malignant prostate cells, making it consistent for an uh, oncogenesis model. And we see no association with a hypomorphic RNA cell allele. Some general lessons that we've heard from this, and, and this will be important as you, if you read the literature or you read um, reports of what somebody is summarizing about the paper, if you keep these things in mind. Tumors contain very tiny amounts of virus. I mean, these are really tiny amounts. And I think that that's going to be true of any pathogens that we find uh, from now on, because I think a lot of the pathogens that were present in abundant amounts have been already discovered. And, 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 and now is the era of finding either um, the pathogen that's present in very small amounts or the pathogen that's, that may be present in um, abundant amounts, but there's a particular genotype variant of it that causes disease. And, and here I'm thinking of the norovirus, um, uh, ca you know, causing um, IBD. You know, there's a particular kind of norovirus that causes IBD, and the others don't. So, so I think uh, those are the kinds of things you should be thinking about. Um, the other thing is that contamination from mouse tissues can occur very easily if the same microtome is used to cut human and mouse tissues. Now, many research labs um, uh, process mouse tissues at this, on the same machine that they process human tissues, and we found that that was a huge problem in our initial um, uh, few things that we just, we just had to discard about 100 samples that we cut originally uh, because of mouse contamination. Uh, the other thing to remember is that deeper sections cut from the same tumor may have very different amounts of virus than the first few sections. And detection of the virus by immunohistochemistry has not worked well in tissue microarrays for us. Um, and full sections are the best, which just makes everything much more expensive and time consuming. But it also helps you understand that, that somebody doesn't find the virus, it may be because they were just focused on tissue microarrays, which are these small, very small pieces of tissue. Um, there's, uh, in, if you go to my lab website, uh, which is given here, there's an XMRV website which has a lot more information on um, publications. So this, this is a page that gets an automatic update no matter who publishes on XMRV. Uh, this page gets updated with the publications on it. And then you can find out more things about XMRV. So here are protocols from my lab that we've published and made available to, to everyone who wants to use it. And, and these give a little more detail than what you can put in, in a scientific paper um, and so on. <laughs>